Please welcome to the stage Dr. Susan Mims, Ralph Gillenhouse, Brittany Pruitt Fletcher, and Kelly McCullen. Well, hello everyone, how are you? There you go. <laughs> It's 2.05. I've got a great panel up here. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, my name is Kelly McCullen. I work for PBS North Carolina, the TV and digital network, and, and it's an honor to be here on the stage with these three experts. We're going to be talking about strengthening North Carolina's support systems. And when I say support systems, it means a lot of different things. Some things we easily think about helping folks pay the light bill, maybe keeping them current on their mortgage or their rent payment. And then things that I didn't, I knew it, but I didn't appreciate it, like stepping out and helping someone complete an income tax return so that they can get an earned income tax credit or a child care tax credit, the things that many of us, regardless of how we perceive ourselves on the economic ladder, we claim those credits. And joining me now are these three experts in the field of social services, really, and they help people, and they want to help other organizations help people more effectively. On the end is Dr. Susan Mims, Chief Executive Officer of the Dogwood Health Trust down there. Mr. Ralph Gildahouse, the Senior Program Director of MDC, long-running program that has served North Carolina well. And Brittany Fletcher is the CEO and a President. I was going to make you Executive Director, but you are <laughs> a President of United Way of North Carolina, which has almost 50 chapters out there serving. They represent local, regional, and statewide reaches with these programs, and it's a pleasure to be here. I, time is of the essence. We want to be efficient. We have four or five to six topics we want to get to about bringing social services, those safety net programs, to people more effectively. Ralph, I want to start with you because your team's working in Guilford and Durham counties. What are the challenges out there when you're trying to bring people to services, get them signed up, and to be honest, get them to embrace those services? What are you seeing? What are you hearing? Sure. Thank you. So over a billion dollars worth of safety net benefits and other community resources are unclaimed every year in North Carolina. And we ask people with lived experience with poverty and economic insecurity, why? What were the barriers? And they said three things. One, lack of information about what um, services and supports were available to them. Two, time consuming and complicated application procedures. And three, little integration of supports and services uh, to uh, support families' plans. People told us it was like a grab bag. No one ever asked what that household wanted to accomplish. So we see that resolving this underutilization involves coordinated networks of nonprofits and public agencies working together to conduct outreach, connect people with supports. Um, we're working with local partners in Greensboro, Durham, and elsewhere uh, to uh, kind of flip the traditional model that's more about um, programs and what people are eligible for and instead centering uh, the needs of families. Ralph, how do you keep your team out there energized when you know they're working hard and you know they think they're communicating clearly, yet families go, either it's just not worth my time or I'm too busy or I just simply can't or it's confusing or it's a grab bag. How do you settle down the team and keep it focused so that that person has faith in your folks to help deliver them what they need? Sure. So the coaches in uh, Greensboro, for example, with the Guilford Success Network, are trained in something called uh, person-centered coaching, uh, which helps them ask uh, you know, generative questions that gets people talking. It's often about building trust. We have to keep in mind that uh, people have had bad experiences with whether it's government or uh, employers, and um, building that trust, that personal connection, is often, uh, is often the first step in helping people navigate to services. Dr. Mims, on the end, 18 <laughs> counties out in the west, Quala Boundary, what are the challenges are you seeing, or is Ralph setting a tone that might traverse this great state of ours? 
Yeah, well, the, the challenges that we see are similar and a little different in that we really serve a rural area. So as a relatively new healthcare conversion foundation, um, we are working to improve the health and well-being of the roughly a million people in the 18 counties of Western North Carolina and the Kuala Boundary. And we're doing that by focusing on these social drivers, non-medical um, drivers of health, and they are what we're hearing from people are their challenges and very important to them. So, you know, we know that people have difficulty accessing safe, affordable, um, and stable housing, as well as, you know, getting the education they need to get a job where they can support their families and, um, and being able to access uh, the necessities of, that they need to live their lives. You know, sometimes we hear people are um, working jobs, low-paying jobs, especially in Western North Carolina with the relatively <coughs> lower wages in the state and the higher cost of housing. Um, they're working these really need, badly needed jobs in, you know, caring and teaching our youngest in our uh, youngest children or our oldest as, as CNAs. Um, and they are having to spend, uh, you know, at sometimes 30% and sometimes 50% of their income on their housing. Uh, so that really leaves um, a little for them to be able to save for education and sometimes they take on debt. So a lot of challenges that we see. The, you, you outlined several challenges. Affordable mm -hmm. housing was the first thing you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Out west, is it a lack of housing stock? Or are there plenty of houses and the rents too, you know, high? Yes and yes. <laughs> so, yeah, we, in the mountains, uh, clearly with the geography, there are limitations on where you can build. We also have the lovely um, national forests that we everyone loves to enjoy that make it difficult, can't build there. So there are limitations on where we can build. And, you know, we have had a lot of folks who want to have a second home or, or come to Western North Carolina, and that also is affecting the availability of the housing stock. Brittany, you take a statewide approach with your near 50 chapters of the United Way. It's slightly different than working at the county level. What are you seeing from 10,000 feet? So at United Way of North Carolina, we um, facilitate the 211 program, um, which is an information and referral service um, and a, a way to access resources anywhere in North Carolina. Last year, we answered about 143,000 calls and identified 260,000 needs from those callers. Um, top three needs requested was housing assistance, utility assistance, and food. And so one of the challenges that we really see across our network are individuals who earn too much money to qualify for public assistance, um, but not enough money to make ends meet. And many times those are the folks that are reaching out to us for the very first time and really aren't sure where to go, who to turn to, or how to navigate accessing resources that may be available for them. What are some challenges that are affecting your team's ability to reach into the local communities? What are challenges to the systems? The people have challenges, times can be hard, but what about for the folks who want to bring help? Um, I think um, my uh, panelists have talked about just having trust and building trust in um, communities. And so that is one thing that we often see with our network and our local United Ways is they're a trusted partner in their local community. Um, when you don't have that trusted partner, then folks can be a little hesitant to even, if there are services available, hesitant to really uh, reach out and ask for the help. Ralph, talk to us about trust. I would think you can supply all the brochures, the, the tangible help at a table and not everybody wants your help, though they need your help. How do you get over those hurdles? Is, is it political or philosophical or the way we were raised or is it urban, rural or? I'll just follow that rabbit hole. Sure, um, I think it helps to work with and through faith-based community organizations uh, that people know and trust in their local communities. Um, so um, we, uh, in the efforts in Greensboro and Durham really build off of that. We have um, helped those communities uh, form and support networks 
of faith-based and nonprofit organizations working together to coordinate the delivery of service. And we're trying to address those three areas that I talked about before um, with structure, that is these networks conducting outreach so people know what's available. Uh, two, uh, we use technology to help simplify uh, connecting with services. And three, practices, um, coaches that are trained in person-centered coaching to uh, help residents develop household plans and then wrap services uh, to support those plans. And I think that the trust is also built when you're working side by side with people. So our theory of change is to stabilize people with work, health, and income supports, connect them with better paying employment through education and career advancement, and to protect their financial gains through financial education and coaching. And when you kind of lay out that pathway, um, particularly as they see it depicted on the technology, they can you know, see their plan uh, visually, I think um, that really helps build trust. Do you find that people who go through your program successfully, how well are you able to convert them into evangelists, if you will, for the brand, for the, and that's not, it, evangelism is a word not in, in a Christian or a religious sense, it's, it's in the sense of, I believe in what you're doing, my neighbor won't, I'm going to bring him or her to you and trust you. So interestingly, uh, our partner, the United Way of Greater Greensboro, with their integrated services delivery model there, has a speakers bureau of people who are participants or graduates of their program. Um, it's also part of the empowerment uh, to teach public speaking. So um, it's really amazing to, uh, to hear them talk about the differences that this approach has made in their lives. Um, and it's also, you know, they're learning uh, communication skills uh, uh, that, that are helpful as well. And public speaking is not easy to do, so if you train that, you've done a I'm, really I'm, nice I'm job. I'm feeling it, Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dr. Mims, I wasn't counting on topic one to discuss trust, but it sort of evolved from this conversation. And you running a trust, you're looking at local providers and organizations. How do you know a local provider is trustworthy and representing what you want to get across to your citizens in Western North Carolina? Did I ask that question correctly? That's a great question. Um, I do think that um, one of the first things we had to do as a relatively new foundation was to learn our region, to listen to people. And um, it, you know, I just love that you said, you know, having some things be person-centered, family-centered, because that is, that is so important. And some of the work that we've done is really driven by those conversations. And oftentimes, it's not one organization that has the trust. It may be one. And it takes multiple organizations sometimes coming together. Um, one of the examples where um, we were looking, you were talking about the, the tax credits. And uh, we know that the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit are some of the most successful tools to bring children out of poverty. And we also you know, know that they have many myriad benefits down the road. And I love what you said, you know, that why is it that the IRS posts on their website almost every year, we have $1.5 billion of tax credits that are going unclaimed. And so it really takes to, to address questions like that, um, we, uh, there are a coalition formed kind of naturally of multiple organizations that had the trust of the community who set out to help people complete their tax returns, access those tax credits, gain some um, financial education along the way, and you know, get more um, financial sustainability resiliency. So those are really important you know, ways to think about who knows the community and who can affect that change well. Doctor, from your perspective, who, let's talk about the people now. Who is being served and embracing these systems and reaching out for all this multifaceted help? Mm -hmm. But more importantly, who is not taking advantage mm -hmm. of what is there for them? Um, yeah, there, you know, we're just about, in this example, we're about two years in, and we're beginning to, um, you know, there's always the easier folks to get to, um, and we are seeing great returns. We've already seen in two years $45 million 
brought back to people through the tax um, credits and through the ACA subsidies. But we also know there are a lot of people out there. There's a lot more to be gained, and it takes um, knowing what those barriers are. I mean, there are um, geographic barriers in, in reaching folks. There are language barriers. There are trust barriers. We talked about trust, and you've got to you know, really know the community and think about how do you, you know, work through trusted partners. And thinking about what we heard this morning, um, the challenges of the systems, which I know 211 is working on to, to make it a bit easier to get through these complex systems and reduce that friction. Ralph Gildahouse, who, who is being served well and who as a group of folks are either not hearing the message or not receiving it and taking advantage of services? So those people being served well are people who have uh, internet access, mm -hmm. have uh, training in how to use computers, um, kind of understand how systems and programs work. So um, my experience has been that, um, you know, the, a, a person who might be, you know, laid off uh, from a job um, and has skills from that job, they were able to, uh, you know, find assistance programs and sign up themselves. Um, and there's some advantages to that. Um, because sometimes mm -hmm. people don't want to go to a social service office, and sometimes in a small town, that can be a particularly big issue. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the people who aren't accessing it um, are, uh, have a lot of the same challenges that Susan was talking about. Transportation, child care, um, uh, trust, uh, lack of internet access, and also, unfortunately, there can be shame associated uh, with claiming public benefits mm -hmm. for for example, um, which I think is really unfortunate because we have programs that are designed uh, to give people nutrition assistance, for example. Um, we've taken a huge step in a positive direction in North Carolina by expanding Medicaid. You're going to hear more about that this afternoon. Um, that's putting a lot more resources into the hands of, of people and, um, and help them, you know, with their with their health care needs. Um, and I think just even the fact that we've done that has helped destigmatize claiming public benefits. Brittany, so what do we do? We, if I don't have a computer and I've got a small child so I can't leave the child alone and don't have a car, solve that for me. <laughs> um, well, if you have a phone, then you can call 211. Um, but I think there are also the benefit of having local organizations in your community. Um, I know several of our United Ways are also funding um, units that sort of go out into mm -hmm. what we would call a resource desert, so a place where resources aren't provided. Um, where do they go? Do they go to the post office or to a drugstore or to a library? Um, library, community <laughs> center. Um, if there's a neighborhood that we know needs or would probably benefit from services, then we may go, um, you know, to the clubhouse of that neighborhood, that community neighborhood, um, to provide services. I think reaching folks kind of where they are, mm -hmm. and so um, if there's opportunities to connect with them uh, through if their child is going to school, is that a way that we can make a connection with them? Um, if the child's going to the doctor or the family's going to the doctor, is that a way we can make a connection to them? So I think we just, as a sector, have to think creatively about how we make those connections to folks that um, may not have access to other resources. Dr. Mims, how are groups keeping measurement over who's not being served? And in your case, overseeing programs, how effective the folks that are being served, how effective are they being served? What metrics are out there? That is a great question, and we're you know fairly early on in this work, so beginning to think about how how do you track what how do you know what you don't know, and 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 that is a challenge I think for everyone. Um, we are seeing some really creative examples of people um, reaching out to those folks where um, they know that there might be concerns about stigma or not you know getting that service and and linking together different sectors to deliver that service in a way that people will accept it. Um, we have one organization that has um, really done something creative with uh, 
a, a, they have a mobile health hub and they would take uh, medical care and dental care to people yeah. and um, they brought in the lawyers to be able to provide some legal services and get them signed up for their tax credits and um, provide some financial counseling along the way in a way that what that could remove that stigma. I'm going to get my health care. Right. That seems to be okay, but, but the getting the financial counseling is something maybe people don't want to admit they need. Ralph, I can't imagine your group has enough money to buy a Super Bowl ad. So how do you advertise <laughs> that the dental clinic, rolling dental clinic's coming or the, or the legal clinic is coming? How do you do it in a way that makes it attractive to a local community so people will be, uh, if not proud to go, at least they, they think, that's going to help me get ahead one day if I just take you up on your offer. Sure. Kelly, let me backtrack just a little bit to some of the structural barriers and then how we overcome them. Um, so I, I just want to explain a little bit that um, a lot of the silos are driven by the programs and the funding that is involved. So there are a lot of people doing good work across North Carolina. Uh, I just want to be very clear on that. Um, but for example, the organizations that are participating in the IRS VITA program, where they have tax preparers that are helping people claim the earned income tax credit, and the child tax credit, helping people prepare their taxes for free, those counselors can't help people with public benefits, for example. And then the folks who are working in the state's SNAP outreach plan, uh, that is to connect people with what used to be called food stamps, they can't help people with taxes or with Medicaid. And, uh, and the, the navigators, they're navigators across uh, the state of North Carolina. We helped co-found the North Carolina Navigator Consortium that uh, connects people with uh, Affordable Care Act, health insurance, and now with expanded Medicaid. Well, they can't help people with taxes or SNAP. So part of the challenge is that uh, you know, people uh, you know, need a holistic approach, and that's why these coalitions, these networks are so important because the programs don't, uh, don't lend itself very well to that. Um, then in, in terms of how do, you, how do you do that outreach? Well, I'll give a, a couple of examples. Um, our partner, Haiti Reborn Justice Movement, um, they sponsor a lot of events in the community that are certainly beneficial to people participating, but they also have the other benefit of publicizing the wraparound mm -hmm. services, the program that they have with the community college for people who are seeking employment. So, you know, their, their kids might be participating in a, a summer rec league um, and the parents are learning about these services that Haiti Reborn is providing. Um, in Guilford County, with the Guilford Success Network, we've uh, had to be very deliberate about, um, uh, about how we pitch the, uh, the services. I mean, I'll tell you, that's been our biggest challenge, is just getting people uh, involved. Because, you know, in some ways, you're asking people to do just one more thing when they're already struggling. So uh, we've created literature that's very, very clear on what the benefits are. And uh, we've just started a pilot program that uh, compensates people for some of their time. You know, when they enroll, there's, uh, there's some compensation. When they go to another step, I think it's a little bit, for those of you who were uh, listening to Marielle about uh, the, the punch card at the Community Empowerment Fund, it's a little like that just having some way of, of keeping people engaged. Um, we're also working hard in Guilford County to connect with those organizations that see a lot of people, mm -hmm. right? So that would be the DSS office, mm -hmm. uh, the schools, uh, health clinics, uh, anywhere, you know, faith-based organizations, anywhere that, that see a lot of people we want to be uh, in front of them, and we've made it easy with literature mm -hmm. that has QR codes, et cetera. So um, lots of strategies to reach people, Kelly. S simplify this one for me. If, if we're from four different agencies in a room and, and these are people that are wanting help, would I be allowed to sign them up for my program? Am I allowed by law to go, you really want to see her too? And then, or, or is it, I just can't fill out her form 
You can't fill out the form. You can all be together at a community event, Kelly. So you can do that. You got to organize it. You've got to organize. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, but it, that, that's part of the challenge. I mean, and it's, the people it's, have to come. Yeah. Right. And and how if if there's a table of ten organizations out there, just from your gut, from what you've lived, how how many tables will I get down before I go? That's enough for today. I've got to go home and cook. I've got to go home and clean or do the yard work. Or, is that what happens? So we have to remember. I mean, these are these are folks who are really life gets in the way right. right I mean some some of the folks we're talking about are um, not working one low-paying job but two mm -hmm. and caring for their families and trying to put food on the table and you know there's mm -hmm. just there's a lot of barriers when you um, you know some folks have opportunities and other folks haven't had those opportunities and trying to kind of get that leg up and get supported um, to, to then get your life in order. It takes a lot. It's a real challenge for folks. One approach that our local United Way, a few of our local United Ways have started doing is, um, so oftentimes they call it place-based funding. Mm -hmm. And so when they are thinking about how to distribute the dollars that they have, um, the folks that are coming to the table to help make some of those funding decisions and to really talk about what is needed in those particular communities are the folks that live in those communities. And that's been very powerful because if my neighbor invites me to a community event, I'm much more likely to go versus if Brittany shows up and it's the first time I'm meeting her, or she sends me a flyer, hmm, I'm not so sure about that. And so it's been a very powerful approach to really engaging community in a different way than maybe traditionally we've done in the past. If you've got one or two programs to sign a person up for and you know they're going to walk out on you because they don't have any more time than that, which programs do you recommend they go to first? I'd say that depends on the person. Okay. I would ask them what's important to them, a parent, what do they need. A young parent that needs, is it, are tax mm -hmm. credits where they go? Is it, and it, maybe it's unfair to ask you to judge one program over another, but is there one that packs more economic punch for a, a, a geographical region? Would it be signing up for Medicaid, making sure you're in the expansion, or is it make sure you file your income tax, get that tax credit back? Again, it depends upon the person, mm -hmm. but it is hard for me to believe that Medicaid won't be very impactful mm -hmm. for people because um, it's expenses saved and it's health supported. So it, it has kind of a double whammy, in my opinion. Yeah. Let's switch gears to topic three, and, and these are how the barriers are being tackled. We've touched on this already, Brittany, but at the macro level, because you reach so far with the United Way, um, what's well, proving to be successful? If we can't do everything the way we want it, what is working out there from what you're seeing top down? Um, I think some of the things that are working is uh, having a system where the resources that we know about are in a central location. So there's a place for people to go. There's a place for people to turn. If it's the first time that they're experiencing, experiencing an issue, then they can reach out to 2 and one We can at least provide them with some stepping stones as to what steps to take. And so for us, we've seen that having this resource database is essential to just getting people in the right direction. Do you, do you get to keep track of a person if you give them a reference? Do you know whether they followed that reference down to their hometown service provider? Um, so with 211, we do not. We are also part of um, a program called NC Care 360. And if service providers are part of that platform, then we can track the client and what services they're receiving. Ralph, if, if you could change federal and state policy to make it work the way it needs to work. There you go. How would you do it? How would you break down the, what, what, in a practical sense, what could this country and state do to make it easy to get, person, to get a person on their feet from the time they step up to your table? Well, let's talk about what works and then how we could change it. There you go. So uh, a good example of what works is the North Carolina Navigator Consortium, okay? These are, as I said, the people who sign up people for Medicaid and uh, Affordable Care Act health insurance. And there are about 11 organizations. Um, they get a federal grant. Uh, that grant money pays for navigators in the field to connect people um, with, those, with that health insurance. 
And uh, we are very successful in North Carolina at that. We have the fourth largest enrollments um, in Affordable Care Act health insurance, and we have the ninth largest population. So I would say we punch above our weight class, and that's, that's great. That shows that, and I have to say, you know, 10 years ago, there were a bunch of us uh, sitting around trying to figure out what we were going to do when the state decided it was not going to sponsor a state-based plan. This is getting a little technical, but there was $23 million that was supposed to come to North Carolina for outreach that was sent back, and we decided instead to use the federal exchange. And we all got together and organized and said, we've got to do something else. We've got to form a coalition, what we turned out to be a consortium, that would make this work. Now, in the ideal world, because those navigators are doing a great job, but they can only help people with health insurance. I would love to see more flexible funding, funding that allowed navigators, counselors, coaches, whatever terminology you want to use, to uh, help people with um, health insurance, with nutrition assistance, with claiming tax credits, with student financial aid. That would break down these barriers. That's hard to do because each of these agencies thinks in their own silo, right? They have their own regulations, and this is going to, this would take change. This would be a funded, have to be a funded program. Congress would have to approve that because the present laws and funding don't allow for that. But if you were really talking about what would work, mm -hmm. it would be to have that kind of integration across programs and it would be paying counselors to do this work in the field. Okay. Yeah, I, I love that you said that. I think that that's one of the reasons that Dogwood Health Trust is focused on all of these areas because recognizing that you can't address one area without addressing another. You're just playing whack-a-mole and, and you're not gonna be successful. And, and I love that the Care Navigator program works so well because I know those Care Navigators come from the community. They're people they know. And then when you think about different communities and accessing different folks, it may be that someone really needs to have this service provided by their peer support specialist because that's who they trust or you know someone in their church or someone. So thinking about that flexibility, one, recognizing how interconnected these issues are and how interconnected we are. And then, you know, thinking about the systems, this artificial siloing that happens through our funding streams. How can we come back to putting patients and families at the center and design a program that works for them? Are there turf issues even at the regional and local levels between service agencies or is it, or does policy and regulations tend to create the silo so it builds the walls for us? There are turf issues. Um, you know, because uh, nonprofit organizations um, are chasing scarce dollars mm -hmm. and coordination, collaboration can be difficult because, um, you know, potentially if you're referring somebody to another organization, uh, you may think, well, the funding to do that is, mm -hmm. is now going over there. Um, that's why building networks, coalitions that might even include sharing resources uh, gets over that. And I, I would add to that too, we're out listening to our communities and one of the biggest things we are hearing is that people, there is no funding, there's no time and space and money to do collaborative work. Mm -hmm. It's very rare that collaborations and consortiums are funded. And that is something we can do differently. Brittany, United Way is a well-known brand, well-known charity, and I, if you've got a local charity, here comes the United Way, and they, they used to do walk, there was a walk for, all these walk for lives and things. How do you, how do you solicit support from a community, and the, but yet not undercut the locals that are there working through, um, through their hard work? Because I would think it's easier for you to raise money than for someone in a small town running a small time charity. Yeah, I think that there's tremendous benefit from having the brand recognition that comes with United Way and kind of going back to that trust factor, like, you know, lots of folks see the United Way logo and they say, well, that's a good organization, even though may not be able to exactly define exactly what a United Way does. There's just a trust factor that comes along with that. Um, so I do think that it is easier for United Way to raise money than maybe those grassroots, but I think that's where it's really important that United Way recognizes that 
and brings alongside those grassroots organizations and you know whether that's through funding or just offering them a seat at the table so they their voice is also heard. Are most of the new groups you go to to reach out to to partner with, are they welcoming of the United Way or do they see you as a large organization that while you may not be threatening their model, you are viewed as a threat to their model? Yeah, um, I think that it sort of depends. It depends on the relationship, um, but I think that's the key to everything is going in, building, trusting relationships and making sure they understand like, we're not here to take over what you're doing. We're here to amplify what you're doing. We're here to shine a flashlight on what you're doing and to highlight the great work that you're doing mm -hmm. because your work matters and it's making a difference. Ralph, let's move to what is really working and you have something your way called the integrated service delivery model. It's hyper locally focused. People say it's working very well and people think these folks should know more about it. What is it? What makes it so effective? Why are you proud of it? Sure. So um, it's in both Durham and in, um, in Greensboro, networks of nonprofit organizations working together to deliver wraparound services, uh, working closely with households to develop their plans and then um, deliver these services to support those plans. And following that theory of change that I talked about of um, stabilizing people, connecting them with better paying employment, uh, and then protecting their financial gains. And those are both demonstration models. You know, I want to be real clear. Um, you know, like Susan said, you know, she's testing uh, uh, many things. Um, and that's part of what nonprofit organizations can do as, uh, as, 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 as part of our value, I think, um, because um, we should be developing new and innovative models and uh, then working to scale those over time. So I'm grateful to our partners in uh, communities who you know, are walking with us. We're, we're supporting them, but I wanna be really clear, they do, they do the work on the ground and uh, we're supporting them with uh, training and technical assistance and resources. Dr. Mims, groups are trying mm -hmm. to impress you from the Dogwood Health Trust, obviously, <laughs> and you're watching very closely. How long do you, how long should they be required to demonstrate success before someone like mm -hmm. you would say, that's a successful model, it needs to be rolled out beyond our boundaries. Well, I will tell you that um, I am very thankful that our board uh, set our time frame as generations. Wow. And I mean, we talk about creating a Western North Carolina where every generation can live, learn, earn, and thrive with opportunity and dignity for all, no exceptions. And so the, the reason they they or have that long long view is because it takes long time to affect change. Mm -hmm. And you know, we often look at the the short term wins, which tend to be more a, a band-aid or a tourniquet on a on a problem when there's acute issue. And to really invest at the root causes of, you know, what are the challenges for our families. Mm -hmm you have to go way upstream, so to speak, in investing in those things. And that is planting a seed, and that tree may not grow for 10, 20, you know, 30 years. And as a funder, I think we have to understand, we can't expect people to change the world next year because of our grant, right? We have to have that long range view and give people the support, um, checking and working, being a partner to know that you're making progress and, and, and the money's well invested, but, but to look for that long range outcome. And that's one of the things a funder can do to catalyze ideas so that others can come in and make them help to, for the sustainability. Brittany, now's the time to talk about 211. Um, <laughs> How can they put a memory of 211 or an understanding of your program in their mind so if they cross someone's path who needs that help or if they need the help themselves, what's the best way to articulate that program? It's a phone number. It is a phone number. Um, it's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, someone will answer the phone. Um, is there a phone tree and all that? Do you have to press one to get to the different people? Or? There is a phone tree, okay. and that's that's uh, aligns with some lines of business that we have, okay. and um, also because it's multilingual, so if you need to connect to a certain language. All right. Um, but th it's also a system that is based on the information that we're providing is based on verified resources. And so what that means is every entry into our database um, we have a 
team of folks that reach out to those organizations that make sure the organization is still providing the service, they make sure the eligibility requirements are the same. So we're not giving you information and that's just a dead end for you. Mm -hmm. We're gonna give you information that you can utilize. The phone number works, the email address, the website, all of that stuff is up to date in our database. Um, so that's a, that is a big piece of how folks in this room could help support 211. Um, if you are an organization that provides a service and you're not in the 211 database, then we would love to have you as a partner in our database. It's a very simple process. You can go to nc211.org and add an agency. There's a form that you fill out um, and that gets you into the database. Currently we have about 13,000 resources um, in our 211 database. And you will vet any organization that may not be in your database for inclusion to provide services. That's right. All right. Kelly, could we bring out the magic wand again just for a moment? Yes. So, um, Work some magic. I really want to emphasize that one of the most important things we can do from uh, a policy perspective is to put more money into the hands of people with low incomes. Um, that's the primary reason why people aren't saving, you know, and are not financially resilient. Um, who are in that situation because they don't, they're not making ends meet. I'll give two really specific examples. One, uh, when student debt payments were paused, people became more economically stable, um, bought houses, you know, improved financially without the burden of those payments. And then the other I would point to, and it's, and it's relevant right now, is of the expanded child tax credit during the pandemic. Childhood poverty in the United States went down by half when that child tax credit was expanded. And Susan and her colleagues worked really hard to connect people with that credit in Western North Carolina. And when that was phased out, childhood poverty went back up to basically where it was before. Luckily, Congress is thinking about expanding it again, which is good. It's passed the House. It's being considered in the Senate. What I want to emphasize is people say, you know, you, can th you can't throw money at poverty to solve it. Well, you know, it turns out you can. <laughs> you waved your wand. Brittany, we can't, we have just a few minutes left, three minutes left, mm -hmm. of a great new program you're launching. It's called ALICE that not many people know about. I can't forget it. So before we get kicked off this stage, it's data. It's putting a human touch behind data. Please, it, and it could affect all of us and, and our panel too. What is it? Absolutely. So um, for a growing number of households, financial stability is nothing more than a pipe dream, no matter how hard those individuals are working. Mm -hmm. Um, these households are ALICE, so Asset Limited Income Constrained Employee. They're earning the federal poverty level, they're earning above the federal poverty level, but not enough to make the ends meet. Um, so United Way of North Carolina will release an ALICE report later this year. You all are the first to hear this officially. Um, the report contains data on household budget, demographics, employment opportunities, housing affordability, so many of the things that we've talked about today. Um, the body of work then really places Alice at the center of community conversations on critical issues. Um, and then all sectors can use this data um, to better understand local economic conditions and the demographics of the community. A whole picture. A whole picture. But it's not out yet. It's not out yet, coming later this year. And will we go to your website and download it? Will you do a big press release, a big event for these folks? There will be, yes. We will have a launch party. Um, so that will be coming this fall. And really, when you think about Alice, it may be a friend, a relative. You may be Alice. Um, and I think when we think about um, who Alice is, the backbone um, of our economy, and I think the pandemic really made it crystal clear at how much we need them. And before we turn over to Sarah, last word, Dr. Mim, sum this discussion up. We have data coming in. It's mm -hmm. going to be very nice. It's great that we'll have this comprehensive data because I think we need to take a comprehensive look at people, not break them up into parts. Thank you so much for your time in this session. I want to turn it back over to Sarah. We're going to stay here till you shoo us away. Are there any questions or... All right. We have time for probably this one. Okay. But given what we just 
heard from the past panel on FinTech and the expertise you all have on behavior change and what's working, what advice do you have for FinTech and other companies and how to design successful platforms to serve those low and moderate income communities specifically? If you're on a roll, <laughs> magic wand, go for it. I think visibility is really important, being able to graphically show a person's finances and the progress that they're making. I have found that with the technology that we're using in Greensboro to be critical. So that's one piece of advice off the top of my head. Great, great advice. Anyone, Anyone else? else want to take that? I would just say working alongside the um, different sectors to help build out um, how the technology will work for the sector and how it will address some of the barriers that we've talked about today. I may sound like a broke it record, but I'd say talk to people. Talk to people. Yeah. That's Figure right. out what they need and how to build it for them. Wonderful, thank you. And I also just want to say, you know, earlier we talked about digital access, digital equity. And I'm so glad you brought that up because I do think that is so critical. Um, so thank you for, for mentioning that as well. Well, thank you to our panel. Um, thank you so much.